myself Everything a little, nothing right I fall by the wayside Cause I've been treading water And I did not even bother Bumbling through I always took the easy way Until I went astray But now it's time I won't turn around No, I won't turn around I realize I've been muted this entire time. And for that, I apologize. I was doing a bunch of stuff. I was like, Greg, why don't you hear me? And I apologize. So let me take that introduction again. My apologies for, let me explain what I was miming. I have a mess back here. I'm going to block it. Again, I am so sorry that my mic is muted. This is something I do so much, whether it's on screen on here, because sometimes I get Outlook emails and stuff. Without further ado, Greg, welcome. All right, good to see you. Good to see you too. So for those of you that weren't at our last episode, um, this is a new series we're doing with Steinberg where we're going to show how Cubase can be used to help you with whatever musical project you're doing. So um, with this one, we're going to be doing dun, 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 Cubase, Cubase techniques for recording bands. So last time we did for hip hop and EDM techniques, but this one's going to be more about if you've recorded vocals or acoustic drums or any non MIDI instrument related thing. Last time it was a lot more MIDI influenced in how you can manipulate MIDI. This one's more on audio files. That's kind of the basis of this. Correct me if I'm wrong, Greg. Yep. So, uh, but before we go into the thick of it, I do want to mention a few things. First of all, we're giving away a pair of uh, Yamaha HPH MT8 headphones, two pairs. As a matter of fact, we've been doing that. A lot of these giveaways. Um, so two people will win a pair. And all you have to do is enter uh, some information on the link. I I'm pointing up here like you guys can see it. But for me, it's on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you are. Just click the link. You can enter. Uh, there are plenty of chances to enter, whether you click this link or that link or enter this information. More things you do, more chances to win. Also, I need to reiterate, as I do on every show for those that tune in frequently, ask us any and all questions. We're happy to answer. Greg is a professional on all things Cubase. The guy knows his stuff. There is hardly anything you can ask him that he can't that he can't answer. Truly. I've I've had I have yet to find a question that he can't answer. But let's try and stump him. That's kind of fun. Because if he is stumped, that means okay, that's something I gotta learn. And maybe this Steinberg and Cubase people are watching go, that'll be in our next update, which is always a good answer. If you can't do it, it's in our next update. But um, all jokes aside, we've got a lot to discuss. Um, I will make sure priority number one is my mic is unmuted when I am on screen or if I'm off screen. So, Greg, what have we got for us today? Yeah, so we'll take a look. First, one of the first things I, I see a lot of people running into problems with, with, especially in maybe not the most ideal recording environments, is you know handling like acoustic drums. 
Um, so one of the things we'll take a look at is if we have a drum part that maybe need the performance needs to be tightened up a little bit. We've all probably played with drummers that when they do a drum fill, uh, that they may, you know, come out of it a little faster or a little slower and then kind of change the tempo. It's pretty common. Um, but let's take a listen to a quick example here uh, just to get a sense of the drum parts. And I'll go ahead and just solo drums. And I'll put the metronome on. So you heard that drum fill there that was a little off rhythmically. I think there's going to be a snare roll. So these could be a little tighter rhythmically. Now, some of the problems with actually quantizing and kind of cleaning up the rhythmic value of these drums is that if you move one, you're going to have drums that are leaking in other microphones. So what we want to do is first to put them into a group, uh, into a folder. So we have this concept in Cubase called folder. So I could take all my drums and just put it into a folder, all my guitars into a folder, vocals. And this way I can navigate large projects very easily. Uh, I will just double click on my kick drum track. And within the sample editor, we could open up our hit points tab. And I'm just going to have it do kind of an analysis. And it's going to find kind of the hit points. Now, as we do this, we, we want to adjust the threshold because you may see other tracks like the hi-hat or snare that bleed through a particular track. So you could just kind of listen to you know different parts so we could find kind of a rhythmically significant parts of our kick drum we could also do this with our snare so just take a look at our snare so we'll adjust our threshold because i think this is actually hi-hat so that's just kind of bleeding through and in this piece the hi-hat is pretty significant uh rhythmically so we'll come over here and we'll just find those kind of rhythmically significant points very fast. Now, once they're in a folder track, we have this thing called group editing. So now I could edit all these different components together. And I'll open up my quantize panel just in the upper right hand corner here. And I could select my different tracks that I have selected and I could choose these as kind of like a rhythmic priority. So I could say I want my kick to have the maybe the top priority, my snare uh, slightly less priority, and we'll do our hi-hats and include that. So what it's done is it's basically, if we look at our drums, it's kind of placed uh, almost like markers across each of those drums based upon those priorities. And what I'm going to do now is to just slice. So instead of manually having to cut each of these drum parts, I'm going to slice those. And as soon as we do that, I could choose my rhythmic value. So I'm going to just choose 16th notes and I will hit quantize. So once I do that, it's going to shift all those values. And a lot of times when we do this, it actually will leave gaps because as the different notes will move, all of them will move simultaneously. So this way, the snare in the snare mic doesn't moves one way and the snare captured in the overhead mic doesn't stay. So they kind of move together. So to fix these gaps, what we could do now is just choose to do a crossfade between them. So now we'll just take a listen to uh, the drum part here with the click. So that's really tight. And if I just undo that and we'll listen to just that last snare roll. And we'll redo, and you'll just hear how it's very tight to the click. And we could do that without losing our natural feel of the track. So if you have a great performance for a drum part, and you just, you know, like one drum fill, you don't want to have to redo the, the drum takes over and over because, you know, one fill sped up. You could just fix that very easily with this tool. That's wild, honestly, because I didn't know there. I mean, 
I, I'm not a recording guy. I, as anyone knows, I basically press record and that's how I get my guitar stuff. As far as production and mixing, that's a, still a whole world I'm learning. But it is pretty wild for those that are just tuning in that in a way you're manipulating drum audio almost like MIDI in the respect that you are quantizing the pieces you have and you're able to move them because like most programs you have to if you really want to chop and move things around you got to do it manually you go to the part you want you chop you got to move it left or right if you want it to be so longer or shorter you got to do the fades etc 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 this is basically taking a lot of that work out especially the fact that you can have that threshold where it's how tight do you want the quantization both literally choosing quantize and that uh, the slider where you're like okay i really want on bass and snare which i mean like if for, look if you're in a punk band or a really bad punk band or a punk band that's just having fun, we know timing is probably the last thing you care about. So this might be your perfect solution if you're a punk drummer and you want to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So I uh, highly recommend that. But it is very cool that you were able to, because I know there is the splicing technology with a lot of uh, DAWs out there, but that how cleanly this is able to be done in such a quick amount of time, I mean, it makes it so that again, like I'm thinking every time I think Cubase, I think Hans Zimmer, cause this is his go-to software. And so this guy is trying to make an entire orchestra of people in time and everything. And granted we can assume he's got the best, so he doesn't need to do multiple takes, but even if he wanted to tweak something or if he wanted to elongate a phrase, especially with percussion, this is making it a million times easier especially if you mic each individual drum, you could probably manipulate your audio like MIDI in wild and crazy ways and moving and shifting things all over the place. So very, very cool that you can do this. Um, is there anything else before we move on about multi-track drum editing? Both yeah, I'll show you something we can do for like doing replacement because a lot of times when people are recording, um, you know, they so many systems and people are used to hearing samples, but they like the live feel Right. of a real drummer. So when we come over here, let's say I'm, I'm just listening to this and let's say like, maybe I'm not you like, I want more from the kick and snare in this track. So we'll just listen to it for context here. So just like we did our hit points for quantization. So in this, I have one of the drum instruments that come standard with Cubase called Groove Agent. And we could actually just drag and drop our own samples in. So even if I say, you know what, the drummer just nailed uh, the kick drum once magically. Uh, at this point, what we could do is I could just select like with a range selection tool, I could select three different tracks of the kick drum and drag it directly onto a drum pad and be able to trigger that. So at that point, it's just very fast and easy to work with. But if I wanted to do drum replacement, um, where I have samples loaded in, what I could do is I will just, you know, go to my hit points like we did earlier, and we'll just come right over here. And from our hit points tab, I could say, I'm going to just have this track selected where, and this works with any virtual instrument. And I'll just say, let's create MIDI notes. And I will put it onto, let's say, pitch of C1. I will retain the dynamics from the original track. And now I hit OK. And at this point, we could just have our drums. We'll have the kick drum triggered here in MIDI. And I'll move that, make that a little louder. And I'll mute the original kicks. So if I wanted to perhaps tune the kick drum differently, I could just go to my course tuning. And as we just listen to it, or tune it higher, or blend it with the original. And if I take that out, So you could easily do like drum replacements for kick and snare without, again, having a third party tool that, you know, tends to 
you know, maybe not work with an operating system update when your DAW does, but that level of integration. So you could, again, just kind of fix those common problems that you do run into. That's I'm like, again, this is all stuff that's very privy to what I always wonder how you can get done. And it's very cool that you're able like you keep using the term MIDI and I don't want to confuse the audience. This isn't MIDI in its truest form. These are not, these are audio files first, but you're operating them like MIDI files in the sense that the reorganization of things. And I love the fact that you can take that drum track and say you can either. And what's great is you have that option of, OK, he hit the kick drum and maybe one time it was too loud or it wasn't consistent. You could make it consistent if you want without having to cut and copy and paste so often you make it into a sampler version correct me if i'm wrong yeah and i love that you can almost eq and tune it so especially if sometimes when people are playing drums it's i mean god god bless any mixing engineer that is focuses solely on drum work because it's one thing to mix a guitar which is one solitary sound but you're talking about there's a reason it's called drum kit you're dealing with a snare and a kick drum, cymbals. You have an overhead mic. You have uh, singular mics all over the place. You have a kick drum mic and mic and drums will bleed into other mics. So all that being said, the fact that this can really isolate those true sounds you love after recording, manipulate them so you have the perfect takes in perfect time and you can EQ it perfectly. All that being done in what Greg is showing you matter of seconds let alone minutes makes it a much easier way to get your projects done and what i've been learning about the cubase program is it's their goal to make your workflow not only smoother as far as getting things done but time if you've got a lot of music ideas you're the next prince so to speak and you've got hundreds of songs in the bank i mean I don't know how he recorded them all in the 80s, but now you can get those 100 songs maybe done, done in a day. So, and we're just talking drums. We haven't even gone on to other instruments. And this is just drum editing and replacement. Greg, this is what I love about you doing this. You make this so easy, so simple. You get right to the so source of it. Couldn't ask for more. Uh, however, I could ask for more knowledge from you in general about uh, Cubase techniques. So, uh while we're at it, first of all, to anyone who's watching, if you have questions or want him to, we're, we're happy to go back to a subject if we need to. Um, but if you want, um, if you want us to discuss multi-track drum editing and replacement in any specific way, or will this work with this? Can I do it like this? What mic setup? We're here. Like I said, boom. Ask us any and all questions. We are happy to answer. This is a live show. Think of it as a call-in show. I, I've been watching a lot of Frasier, so forgive me. But think of it as a call-in show. You can ask us questions. We're happy to respond. We're happy to give you the best advice possible. Obviously, Greg's is going to be way more valid than mine. I'm just the salesman at the end of the day. But in any case, um, Greg, is there anything we should bring up about drums? I know I keep asking that, but I want to make sure we're covering all our bases. You know, I think one thing that a lot of people have questions on is kind of parallel processing and how to effectively do that. And it's some, sometimes often referred to as New York compression. Um, I hope and, that's a compliment and not an insult coming from a New Yorker. Yeah. So I'm going to take these drum tracks here and I'm just going to, um, you know, just within my mix console, I could actually, I will just add a couple of, I'm going to add two group tracks. So we'll make these two stereo groups. And the concept of a parallel process is where we could take kind of different sound sources and route them and to two different destinations and process one differently. So a lot of times with parallel processing, you may want kind of like the natural dynamics, but you may want that blended in with the actual dynamics of something that's been compressed. So I will come over here and I'm just gonna route all these drum tracks to both of the groups. And I will turn this, these on. And what we want to do now is, as we play this, we'll look at our mix console. So I'll see all my drums being routed to this group. And what that's gonna allow me to do, 
is to I could control just the overall volume of my particular drums. So when I wanted to just route, make the drums louder here, or I could just take my drums to a parallel group. So it's basically sending it to two different destinations. And in my parallel group, what I'm able to do is I could just apply some like really heavy compression on this. So I'll just go to like the Cubase channel strip. And at this point, I'll just kind of really squash that. Um, and what you do is just kind of take that original signal that's unprocessed. And now we could blend in the compressed signal, kind of find that sweet spot. So it's just kind of drums by himself. And now if I want kind of a beefier sound, we could just blend that in. So we have kind of the original dynamics plus kind of a controlled dynamics blended together. So that's a very popular technique for drums. Very, very cool. I, I don't even think I can add to that. That's just as simple as an explanation as I, and I didn't even understand it when you just, what you said cross wedding. How did you phrase it? Or parallel um, something? Yeah, just parallel processing. Parallel processing. When you yeah. said that, I was like, okay, this is going to get dense for me. And then long and short of it, we saw it was that simple. You guys have... Oh, why Why in the music industry do we have these complicated phrases for the simplest thing? I guess it's mm -hmm. just to make us sound smart. That's the only thing I can imagine. Um, yeah, and I think it's also, you know, that's why you pay someone to handle for you. So Yeah. We're like the mechanics of the music industry. Yeah, It's not so bad to do, and it's very easy, but we get the big bucks because we're willing to do it, and we do it well. So, all right. That's a lot on drums, and it's a lot to do with drums. Um, so we did parallel processing, which is awesome. But I, as a guitar player, I need to know this. I need to know what you can do with uh, guitar. And I have to imagine you've got some sound sources in here such as working with virtual amps. What a segue that was, huh? Yeah, nice. <laughs> so <laughs> in any case, uh, in all seriousness, I am very excited because I'm a guitar player. I'm always looking for where I can make new sounds, whether it's miking up my amp, whether it's going into a multi-effect processor. So I'm curious what Cubase can do if I've got a Steinberg interface, got my guitar, got a cable to plug the two together. Where do I go from there? Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, Steinberg has, is we've been doing, I think we we're actually the first company that ever did like a software based guitar amp, I think in 1995. So very early on. Um, and I got this project from a friend of mine. Um, and I'll just play just a, a couple seconds of it here just for reference. And I did just kind of a, a remix of it. You know, you sent me the project and he was like, oh, use it for demos. I would love to have you use it for demonstrations. But he saw me do a demo and he's like, why do the guitar sound so much better? Uh, and he had actually recorded through an amp, but he was clever enough to also record direct, uh, just the guitar direct. And that's what we kind of have here. So I'm just going to open this up. And one of the plugins that comes standard with Cubase is going to be what's called a VST amp rack. So I will just, and we have two guitars that are kind of panned uh, in the left and right channels. Uh, and the VST amp rack will allow you to have different pre effects. So if you want to have a gate kind of before your guitar hits, you could choose different amplifiers that are very familiar. So, you know, some that look mysteriously like Vox, some that look like Marshall, some that look like Fenders, etc. Uh, different cabinet configurations. You could have an entire pedal board. You could rearrange. So, forgive me to interrupt for interrupting. I'm noticing the arrows on this. So unlike a real pedal board, usually it goes from right to left. On this, though, it's from left to right, I'm assuming, with the arrows? Yeah, it's left to right, yeah. Okay, so that that's something, like, as a guitar player, I just happen to notice. So if you are using this program, uh, if you want – your if you want your pedals or your in this case your effects to affect each other do be aware that it's going from left to right because that will affect your tone i mean as a guitar player i know this that if i have a pedal board that um if 
I could have my distortion go into my delay or I could have my delay go into my distortion and it's two totally different sounds. Yes. So if you are a novice guitar player or just getting into effects or you're recording another guitar player, keep this in mind because that will affect the tone. So continue on though. Yeah, and we'll also have you know two different microphones. So you have kind of a classic dynamic and a condenser mic that you could blend between. Um, and then you could also have master effects. So you have kind of pre-effects, like an effects like in your, your effects loop and master effects. So let's just go ahead and I'll just kind of mute the guitars, uh, the guitar amps here, um, just so you could hear kind of the, what the raw guitars sound like. So we'll just... So as we listen to the guitars, and now in contact with the mix, and now we turn these on. I got some cheap wine. Let's have a good time. I never promised you. And if you want to try different cabinets. But if you're missing me, let it be. So, you know, especially if you're recording at home, you can get just a great sound. And one of my, you know, um, I don't mean to interrupt, videos. Greg. Uh, do you mind playing that again, but also muting your vocal mic, your personal ones? Because sure. so, I think it's trying to get both sound sources simultaneously. So okay. Yeah, I'll mind, do that like, for you. Sorry. I'm sure the guitar does sound great. So we're going to do this again for those that are watching, just so you can hear it more authentically. I got some cheap wine. Let's have a good time. So that's wild because what took me aback was it was powerful as all heck. But when you took when you bypassed everything and I mean, no insult to the guitar player, it was the weakest sounding guitar part I've ever heard. As far as tone, it was just brittle and nothing. And these VST plugins just like just a big old punch of sound, which is interesting because I someone did ask a question and it's almost perfect to what we just discussed. Tamara said, I'm so basic. I'm sure you're not. Uh, I use my Cubase just like I did with a cassette recorder and hit record. I just mentioned this early, so I'm, I'm with you. I sing very soft and I play my guitar very soft. It's very difficult to get them balanced between voice and guitar. And how do I burn a CD where I don't have to crank the volume in my car and barely hear it? Sorry, it's so basic. Okay, so to kind of explain what Tamara is going through... Um, it sounds like they are recording. Now, Tamara, I don't know your recording situation, uh, whether you are recording, like you said, guitar. I don't know if that's acoustic or electric, so this may differ in answer. Um, but if you're recording voice, obviously play with the levels and make sure that when your mic's plugged into the interface and you're recording into Cubase, that you're checking the levels to see how high. You obviously don't want them to peak. Um, and then burning a CD... If you still got a CD burner, it's funny. I was just dealing with this earlier where I wish I still had those. But whether you're burning a CD or exporting it as an MP3 or what have you, Greg, I'm sure, can answer this in just a second. But all I all I can say as far as someone who's a novice is definitely uh, record as loud as you can. And if you're doing electric guitar, like I said, this is perfect. If you have quiet guitar, using these kind of effects, it doesn't even have to be distortion. If you want to keep the same tone, you can use effects to boost it like compression or a guitar boost and uh yeah so greg do you have anything to add on that yeah and also with this you know we didn't want to leave our bass player friends out um so we spent kind of just as much time working on uh like the classic bass amps as well so there's a dedicated vst bass amp plug-in so we'll go ahead and open this up. So I'm a bass player and I'm, I have way too many Ampeg um, amps and preamps over the years. But we'll just go ahead and give you an idea what we could do with the bass on this. So I'll mute my mic as I do this.
time is running out. But I'll be back again. Until the next time. It's not the end. So you get that classic Ampeg grit that, you know, is really hard to capture. That and like you know, so many people tone. spend a lot of time dialing into guitars and kind of forget the bass. So, you know, to have that kind of classic tone is really a great addition. So we've talked about electric guitar. We've talked about bass. Uh, let's help out Tamara. What can you do with acoustic gu guitar just to see if there's any way to make her situation better? You know, a lot of times with guitars, it, it could depend, like your audio interface could be really critical, especially like if you're doing electric guitars and sometimes acoustic guitars too, if you're like plugging it directly in, make sure that you're going into your audio interface that has a, like a high Z input, like our Steinberg UR interfaces, you know, like Available some of the SamAsh.com and SamAsh locations. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they have a dedicated high Z input because a lot of times people will plug a, a guitar directly into like a line level and it, it doesn't quite work like with the impedance. So if you plug it into like a high Z input, um, that can make a world of difference. And it kind of is sending the correct signal to the audio interface to be captured from your guitar base. And obviously if you're miking, there's millions of guitar techniques of miking acoustics. You can actually find them at our spotlight channel of how to mic your uh, acoustic guitar. Some people that use a condenser and a dynamic, they position it. Uh, it's always going to be preference, but if you want the loudest tone, obviously sound hole works or even having another one or instead closer to the 12th fret. Again, playing, that's the greatest thing about being a musician. There's no wrong answer except the one you don't like. So I know that sounds weird, but it basically is, if you don't like how it sounds, then that's not the sound you want. Just keep playing around with it. And I should also reiterate that Greg does this Steinberg tutorial stuff all the time on Steinberg's YouTube page. So he's given, he's gracing us with his presence and we're very grateful so we can hone in on a certain thing like this, but definitely visit uh, their live streams when Greg does them because he's doing all this all the time and answers a lot of great questions um and also tamara just call samash.com anytime you want 1-800-4-SAMASH we have representatives who can help you with this kind of thing and also recommend equipment that might suit your needs because maybe you are missing that one piece of equipment you might need yeah um, and send us an audio file and we'd be glad to listen to it as well there's that too see i didn't want to put i didn't want to pressure greg but greg's offering his services he's happy to help uh we have a question from jim Yi who asks can you assign the pedals from left to right instead of one, two, three, four to two, one, three, four in Cubase? So I think he's just wondering what re can you reorder pedals? And yeah, I'm so that's no problem. There. So as soon as you wanted to go to uh, your effects, you can come over here. So let's just say I have a flanger and let's say an octaver. And then, you know, if you wanted to, um, you know, you could basically just choose to you know, add it, another plugin in the middle. You can, you know, just, you know, reorder kind of as many of the plugins as you want. And if you just say, okay, I want it to change that effect. So it's all very virtual. So you could experiment a lot with, you know, you know, doing your chain of plugins and, you know, like had the delay go into a, a reverb after and then, a, you know, and then processing after that. So which is so much easier than being like when it comes to guitar pedals and you want to test sounds, this is so much easier than dealing with real pedals where you're pulling cables in and out, you're putting power supplies in and out. You got to rearrange it on the board. You got to remember how something sounds. So you don't have a, it's a whole mess. This is so much easier. I'm curious though, are there ways to do things like an effects loop on this? Is that a possibility? You know, um, once you have the guitar part here, this could show up as an insert effect or you could do it as a send effect on a channel. So, you know, this guitar with all of its pedals can be just one effect and like you could have 15 inserts and eight send effects in addition to that. That go into this guitar effect. Yeah, that they go into that one like particular track. And then if you double the track, you could have, you know, 
24 more uh, plugins if needed. Very cool. Um, how about EQing? How does that work when you're doing VST guitar? I mean, you were showing a little bit, but um, are there like presets? Like if say I'm not, I don't know a thing about EQ, let's say, and I want to have more of a Pantera type guitar tone rather than a Led Zeppelin type guitar tone, but I don't understand how to get those tones. Is there a way to find those easier or just at least? There's a lot of presets? presets that come with it. But one of the great things is if you know what the key of your song is, the built-in EQ and QA. So let's say, oh, I'm in the key of A for this song. I could turn on a band of EQ. And you know, when we deal with EQs, often what you have is a frequency. And this frequency is actually a note. Um, and that's where a lot of people miss. So, you know, the beautiful thing with the built-in Cubase EQs, you can say, I'm in a key of A. So I'm going to go to A. I just type in A2 and hit enter. And it puts the EQ on that particular frequency range that matches the key of the song, which is something that's so simple and so effective, you know, because if you're in a, in a song in the key of D and a song in the key of A, does really re represent different frequencies and being able to realize that and easily EQ based on the key and the notes of the song, you know, makes a lot of sense. Honestly, and I'm not being hyperbolic, that is blowing my mind, that little scientific nuance. Because I personally, I, I take for granted that all notes are frequencies. It, for those that are watching, little music education uh, class here, every single note has a frequency. That's just science. And it's and every sound has a frequency. So by virtue of that fact, if every note has a frequency, every note has a frequency range in a scale. So if you're dealing with the A scale, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A. I, I just picked a random scale, which would work with me. Um, but in all seriousness, you can, it's each of those notes have their own frequency. So C would be different from C sharp, for example. So C sharp has a frequency. So the fact that you guys have an EQ system that works in relation to the key is brilliant in the fact that it will make a more, again, faster workflow but less guesswork because you've already set it up to go, okay, we're in A, so the frequency range is this, so I can manipulate it this without going in depth. You basically made a shortcut to what they need to do with EQing. So yeah. that's awesome. And I'm not blowing smoke up anyone's, you know what? I'm serious. This is very cool if you know what you're doing as far as recording. If you're like, this song's going to be in D, Already you've got the EQ set up, which that's amazing. And you're going to get a faster sounding or a better sounding song faster. So very cool. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, honestly. Um, so that's, uh, so is there, before we move on to the next thing, is there anything else, both Greg and our uh, viewers that want to know about virtual amps? I'm sure there's a lot. We're happy to answer. And again, we're happy to go back to those things. Um, but if not, we can move on to the next topic. Up to you, Greg. I'm ready to move on if you want to take a look at some uh, vocal stuff real quick. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do some vocal alignment. Now, Greg told me about vocal alignment. He wanted me to do some guessing games in my own head about what that means because so far I've been surprised by every term and what it actually entails. So let's see what it means to align some of these vocals. I'm very curious about this. Yeah. Now, you know, since we can record in computers, it means that we can have a lot more tracks than the old days of like a 24 track or maybe two 24 tracks locked together. So it's, it's common to have like lots of background vocals stacked. Uh, and the problem is sometimes it's the same singer doing all of the takes so it could be you know i've been in sessions where it's hundreds and hundreds of takes and you know by take 162 maybe they're losing a little bit of energy in the vocal recording so let's go ahead and just take a listen to and maybe you know rhythmically it's not as tight as it could be so we'll listen to an example here somos iguales somos iguales so it sounds nice, but we if you even look at the waveforms, that they could be tighter rhythmically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just select one as kind of like a master guide 
uh, I will open up my audio uh, audio alignment panel and I'm going to set this as a reference track. I'm going to set the other tracks here as targets and I could select multiple tracks at once. So, if, and this is also great for like, you know, like a double guitar solo, you know, stuff like that. So I'm going to set those to targets and now I just click on align audio. And we can see that they're just kind of tightened up and we'll listen to it. So mossy wireless. So mossy wireless. So, so you get to see how much tighter that is without having to go through each syllable and each track and kind of slide it around. You can just kind of do it instantly. So for so you're basically suggesting that if say a singer like sometimes just there's not always someone literally doing this in the booth. It's just a bunch of people working against each other. So instead of playing with stretching tools and whatnot, you can have, I mean, granted, you can't be completely out of time with each other. I would imagine it would be stressful, so to speak, on the program. But if the team of vocalists is all singing and they're relatively in good time, this is making it so you go, all right, out of all the musicians, all the singers, that guy got it the best timing. I want all of them to be in that timing, but I don't want to keep recording and making sure that they're on the metronome. So now, boom, in one set, in one quick click, you quantize vocals by stretching them rhythmically perfectly to whichever one you want. What? Yeah, <laughs> and I think you know one of the things that you do that you encounter during 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 a recording is you reach that point of no return where it's like, you're not gonna get a good take at a certain point. It's just lost for the evening. So, you know, you could still kind of get something into ballpark and clean it up rhythmically very easily. Right, okay. So yeah, this is amazing that, what Greg is basically saying is, um, now it depends how you look at this, because usually the recording engineer wants you to use more time in the studio, but now you, if you want to flip it on a positive note, now you can have more clients rather than dealing with one client who's maybe a multi-millionaire, but they're like not the best musician. So you want to get them out of the studio quicker. You go, all right, we got the take. And then you've got all these magic tools under your belt with Cubase to go, okay, their gang vocals. Eh, yeah. I'm not going to tell my client they weren't great, but we got them out of the studio. Let's fix it up. Boom. Or if you are trying to do a choral thing like, one of my favorite musicians, Todd Rundgren, and he did every single part by himself in his studio in m many of his old sessions. And so he would, pro and I can't even imagine, he would probably have to sing the same part perfectly in time. And then he'd hear it back and go, oh, I sang, I ended it too quick there, or I ended, or I started too early. So I, I know I'm blabbing, but I, again, this is one of those cool features that I love this kind of technology and I hope that what people that are watching are enjoying this too, because this is blowing my mind and I'm in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. I should also mention, while well, I've got your attention to the, to the, whomever is watching still got a giveaway. We're giving away a pair of headphones to two different people. Uh, so it's as easy as signing up one entry or multiple entries, your call, just go to the link. It's now on our both Facebook and YouTube's descriptions and in the Facebook comments pinned, just in case you don't know where it is. Uh, we And we'll call some winners out in about 15, 20 minutes. But uh, that's nuts. I, I love that feature. I'm not even a vocalist, and I love that feature. So um, we've dealt with drums. We've dealt with stringed instruments or really any instrument you plug into your interface. Um, and now we've dealt with vocals. We now know you can realign your vocals. Is there Are there any other vocal tricks you can do besides alignment? You know, built in, and we showed just a little bit on the last Hangout, but you always have like, you know, very audio for doing tuning for those who haven't seen the previous Hangout, you know, where you could just, you know, take entire vocal phrases and really kind of treat it just like a MIDI where you say, you know, and take all of these notes and, you know, as we do that, you know, I'll just take this phrase and, you know, knock it in tune. We could adjust a vibrato. So all sorts of stuff. And, you know, we, we, we went into a little bit in the last one. But for those who didn't see that, you know, that's another fantastic vocal thing to do inside of Cubase. Very cool. So 
Um, since we've, uh, and again, like if you're watching, we're here to ask any, or excuse me, not ask, answer any and all questions. We're here to, we're here to help. We're happy to do so. We've got this time for you. We reserved it. Greg and I could be partying it up somewhere, but we were like, no, the party people got to wait. We got to teach some people about Cubase right now for this hour. So um, let's talk about, which is interesting, because as we all know, people say, okay, look, I mix with monitors. That's the only way I will mix. Anything else is sacrilegious. Get out of my face. If it's not two boxes on my desk, I don't want to mix. But Greg says that you can do this now with headphone mixes. Now, a lot of engineers might say, what are you talking about? That's not as true as it is. And you can only do so much, but it really comes from the monitors. But what, Greg, can we do that's so special with headphone mixing that makes Cubase really unique to do so? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to go show something a little different of setting up the headphone mix for the musicians when they're recording, uh, which is a really critical thing that people forget. And it's kind of something that a lot of people go to like a traditional recording studio with an analog console so that, you know, everyone could have their more me headphone mix. Um, so and Cubase has a function called the control room that's built in. And what this allows you to do is you go to the audio connections and we could take, you know, four independent headphone mixes. So let's say in this example, we have drums, bass, guitar, and vocals. And while they're recording, the drummer may want to hear more of themselves and maybe more of the bass and less guitar. And the guitar player wants to hear more of themselves in their headphone mix. So, and this gets to be really tricky uh, working in a DAW. So what I'm going to do is we'll go to my mix console and I'm going to just select all of my channels and we're going to set up a headphone mix so that each musician can hear what they need to to get the best recording take and the headphone mix is really critical for you know capturing takes so like if you're working with a vocalist you know if you if you give them too much of themselves in the headphones they sing out of tune if you don't give them enough they sing out of tune in a different way so you know, getting that headphone mix is really critical for people. So I'm going to come over here and first I'm just going to go into control room and I'm going to activate all the Q sends for all the different mixes here. And to do a more me headphone mix, I'm going to first off just kind of right click in here and I'm going to use the current mix levels of all of the tracks. So basically the levels of the mix console here is now applied here. And so if I wanted this particular track to be more in the drummer's headphone mix, I would adjust this slider. So I will quickly build up, a, a, so we'll start with our drums and I'm going to select all my drum parts here and I'll hold down alter option plus shift and I'm just going to increase the level of the drums in the drummer's headphone mix. I'll go to the bass player and send more bass to the to the bass player in their headphone mix. And let's go to our guitars and we'll send more guitars to their headphone mix. So as I listen to this, uh, we could actually switch between these different headphone mixes. So I could listen to the mix as we do this and I'll just mute my mic, and then we'll switch to the drummer's headphone mix, the bass player's headphone mix, and then the guitar player's headphone mix. Now let's say the drummer wants to hear more of the bass in their headphone mix. I would just take the bass track here and at this point just simply you know, give more bass. So we listen to the drummer's headphone mix. There's going to be drums and more bass and less guitar and vocal.
the last mix is going to be the mix that's in the control room. <clears throat> now, as we're tracking, sometimes, you know, we run into where people can't communicate and they're just shouting from one room to the other. But we could actually just turn a microphone and connect it to your audio interface and enable the talk back. And you could communicate with each of the musicians. So if you wanted to, you could say, you know, OK, the bass player missed the cue. So I'm going to talk to everyone except the bass player and say, uh, someone please give the bass player a cue, then turn on the talk back to the bass player and say, oh, that's uh, that was great. You know, just see if you get that entrance one more time. And the beauty of this whole system is it's actually the headphone mix for each of the musicians is saved with the project. So once you open up the project again, you don't have to sit there and have a separate system that's not integrated with the program. That's, I mean, especially what's great about this that I love is how you should, like, especially with these kind of programs, you usually have to do all this really ridiculous routing type stuff, which can be very time consuming and complicated. And at one point, someone in the band's like, just play them through the speakers. Come on, let's just do this. So now you just made it a lot easier. And in a way, it's almost it's it's interesting how you do it similar to just mixing in general, like not just forget headphone mixing, just the idea of, OK, I want to hear them on studio monitors, like I was saying before. But now you're making it easier for the recording musician, not just the production aspect, that if you are playing with other people, you can go, okay, we're going to play to this track. I want to know how it feels to have this guy, this guy, this guy playing in this part of the room. And I love that you can do that so easily through this. And especially nowadays with social distancing, if you want to jam and you want to have a more authentic feel, that's, this is a great way to go about it. So kudos to Cubase for making this happen. Um, now we've been hearing the click track throughout and I'm very curious because you want to discuss working with the click track. Now we all take it for granted because we're like, okay, it's just the thing that keeps us in time. What is, what more could there be to say? But something tells me Greg knows, Greg, what can you do with this click track? What is so remarkable about it? There's a lot of great things that you do about it, but one of the dilemmas that you have when recording, let's say a band is, do you give them a click track to record to, or do you just let them record freely and try to work with it? Um, so the musicians often don't rehearse with a click track. So, you know, they go into a studio and they're, you know, often, you know, a bit, uh, you know, they're a bit uncomfortable. They're not, you know, totally relaxed. Um, and then all of a sudden they go, okay, we're going to put a click track on and play to the click track. And everything that they rehearsed is now different in the studio. Um, so the problem is not that the click track makes the music better. It makes it easier for the engineer. So it doesn't necessarily make the music better. So let's say if I have a, a piece here, like just a quick jazz piece we'll listen to, and I'll turn the click on and we'll just listen to that just and we'll see that there's no correlation between the click and the music forgive me i don't think we can hear anything there we go So again, no no correlation with a click, but you know, let's say if I, had, I to... disagree, but if there was ever anything that was appropriately jazz, it's being completely out of time. Jokes yeah. aside, though. <laughs> so I'm going to come over here and go to my project menu and go to tempo detection. I'm just selecting an overhead drum mic. So now, when we listen to this, um, we could see that it's done an analysis of the parts. And as we listen to it, we will hear that it's figured out what the tempo map is of the tracks automatically. So what I'm going to do now is come over here and I will kind of move, it creates a kind of a tempo track and a time signature track automatically. And we can see that almost every single beat 
is a slightly different tempo. And I'm going to find the downbeat quickly here. All right, and sorry, let me just reboot this quickly here. So, and then what you're able to do is, you know, once we have that tempo map made, we're able to just have that automatically have that correlation between the bar and beat and the click track that's going on. So I will do just a quick, uh, do that one more time very quickly, just to show here. I mean, I, I've got an interesting question while you boot this up, which is, can you, um, like say you have a band that is playing in their own time, could you not only sync them to the click track by basically having the click track guess what it is timing wise, but on top of that, then manipulate things like all the things you showed us about drum, uh, like drum editing and whatnot, now that you have it set to a click track? Yeah. So that, all that's, a, and you could throw in like a drum loop now that that has been done. That's so, I'll just, so cool. I didn't think, okay, so you can work either way. You can either set the click track and then record things to the click or have a song and set the click track to the song. Yes. And then manipulate everything from there. Whoa, that's nuts. That's so cool. So there's, so basically it's, you're giving now musicians who record two ways to get their song made. Yeah. Which now that I think about it, what's fantastic is, especially if you're recording a live show, like someone's talent show or whatnot, no one's performing a talent show or anything to a click track. But if you wanted to take that mix and now set it to a certain BPM, and like you said, add things after the fact, it's not, oh man, they didn't play in time. This is going to be a disaster. It's, oh no, it's okay. They didn't play in time. I've got the click track set up. Now I can add, like you said, drum loops and stuff. Say if it was an acoustic performance. Yeah. So let's say this is our tempo map that was created. And now what I want to do is go to my audio menu. I didn't see my mouse is. And I'm going to go to advanced uh, and I'll select all these events here. And sorry, my mouse is not cooperating today. Let me see if I do my touchpad. Sorry, this looks weird. Take your time. I'm living for this. And I'm going to say set definition from tempo. And what it's going to do is basically apply the tempo changes of every single beat. Oh. And we could have that directly on the files themselves. So now let's say we have our metronome, our tempo. And if I wanted to just make the tempo where instead of fluctuating, I could say, let's make the tempo perfectly 155 beats a minute, perfect without any speeding up or slowing down. Or if I wanted to make it 120 beats a minute perfectly. Or 168. So every single track will just follow whatever tempo I have. I could even select the tempo here and say, oh, the tempo got a little erratic on this part. So what I want to do is just take the tempo and just kind of smooth it out. So now it's not going to fluctuate as much. Or this part, I wanted to do just a retard on the tempo. So, you know, you could select kind of, you know, your different components and just be able to change the tempo. 
So I can say here, let's do a retard. So as we do this, every single track, even if it was recorded at one tempo, we could just still have the variations and have it slow down or speed up. And all the musicians are still together. So that type of tempo manipulation where you have a fantastic recording, but maybe, oh, the end crept up in tempo with the performance, you could just fix in a couple of seconds. So you're that's crazy because usually when you have programs on the market that do tempo fixing, um, it's not like you basically made it automation based. You can change the tempo as you will. So you can go from... Like, usually it's just, okay, you want it in this click? Great. It's going to be 120 the entire song. And if you want to do something else, don't even bother unless you want to get into it. Do it again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now you can manipulate the tempo, which is, again, I keep going back to Hans Zimmer. This is a guy with orchestration. You never know. Maybe he recorded an entire orchestra. He hired all these people for a specific amount of time. He's laid it down. He's got it. He's about to send it into Universal and then goes, or whatever production company, and goes, you know what? Maybe that part should have been a little bit slower because now that now it's getting more tense in that scene of the movie. So it's not like you can suddenly go, all right, everybody, I know I hired you from Hungary and Germany and Berlin and America to get into a room and record this. We got to do it again. No, that's not happening. It's not realistic unless Universal or whatever production company wants to throw down that money. Now you're saying, basically, doesn't matter what they recorded. They could have been super fast. They could have been super slow. They could have been all over the place. This is giving you the option that at any point, you can change the tempo and have that tempo duration for as long as you want. You can make it 130 throughout. You made 130, and then at a certain bar, uh, let's get it 120, 110. Let's slow down. And not even just abruptly slow down to that tempo. So it doesn't. So it is like a flow, like the band's coming together and slowing down, or their yeah. orchestra's coming. And together. sometimes it's really nice, like for the chorus, to be just like a couple beats per minute faster to add a little more energy. You know, you can right. do that very easily with this technique. So if you're a composer arranger, this is your dream doll, honestly, from what it seems like. Just the idea that you have more time manipulation. That's really where it comes down to is the idea that. Tempo is not something that has to be locked in anymore or recorded at a, at a certain way where you record it, that's it, done. No questions asked. That's what, You can only EQ it from there. So personally, I love this. I think that is so cool that you can dramatize, if that's the word. I, don't, I always forget if that's a word or not. I use it a lot. Um, whether or not you can make it more, or rather more dramatic, less dramatic, creeping tension, or suddenly everything is grand and everything's fat, fast paced. So, wow, that is cool. I, and it's I sound like such a nerd saying this stuff, but us musicians, we 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 need our sources of joy where we can get it. And a lot of it is from these DAWs. Like you got people who get Gaga over the new iOS update. This is our version of like when Apple has a new iOS update. We're like, what? You can do that with a DAW? That's nuts. So, um. It, that's nuts. And um, I just think that's so great that you can do this. And forgive me, I keep going on and on about it. But um, is there anything? I, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. I know we have a little bit of, or rather, we don't really have time left. But is there anything that within this we've discussed a lot that you just want to say, hey, guys, you got to check this out? before we go you know I, th- I think you know one of the great things that i think is great about cubase is the fact that all these you know everything i showed you comes standard with cubase pro so it's not like once you have a tool you have to go out and spend you know twice as much money on add-ons to get kind of functionality that we expect uh in our workflows and in this way you know kind of comes with it in one cohesive package so that you could do so much with just the included tools I mean, it, it it like you were showing, it is pretty ridiculous the amount you were showing can be done with something like this. Like it should be. All these techniques are usually incredibly difficult with other DAWs. I won't name them because that's not fair. They all, every DAW is for every person. There's like what 
sneakers do you prefer to wear? Well, maybe you're into this sport or that sport. So there are certain sneakers that do the better job, but you're showing really unique and very cool tools that if you weren't sure what kind of DAW you want, or you are looking for, like, these might be the answers to questions you've had, or maybe didn't even realize you had, maybe you were, maybe you are a composer and you're like, look, I want, I need to get into some kind of program. I want to get into recording an orchestra, but I'm afraid of the limitations I have. This click track solution alone should be the thing that makes you go, okay, sold. I'm, I've got it. Or, all right, well, I've been recording a lot of my friends' bands. They're really not, the, the drummer's not really that great, but I'm doing them a favor and they're paying me pretty well. Uh, it's going to be a mess. How can I make it easier? And then lo and behold. So I think I, I love that in this session, especially because as a musician, it's very applicable to me uh, that you can do all these things. It's really fantastic. It truly is. Um, before we go and before I answer, or excuse me, before I announce the winner of this contest, um, does anyone have any questions? Greg, is there anything else you'd like to say by chance? No, I think you think I'm good. Yeah, hopefully there's some cool tips for people. I, I mean, if no one was watching, I'd think this was cool just for me if I'm going to be selfish. But I'm sure everyone that watched and will be watching this in the future will glean a lot from this live stream. I think it's very cool what you told us today. And it just gets me excited for the next one that you do and the next one that you do. And again, like I said, guys, if you like what uh, Greg has to say and you want to ask him questions, you don't have to wait for just our next live stream. He does this, like I said, regularly on the Steinberg YouTube channel. He loves answering these questions. He loves hearing your feedback. And he lives for this. This is his thing. Some people have video games. Greg's got Cubase. This is his ultimate console. Excuse the pun. He loves this thing. This is what he does. And and he's a master at it. He knows the ins and outs of this. He's been work. How long have you been with Cubase again, remind me? 28 years. 28 years. So he's he's been... <laughs> Using Cubase when it was basically a, like a Mac program where it could barely do anything except maybe move a MIDI file or two before the computer crashed. Now with all this intense stuff, he could do a million more things. Um, but again, Greg, thank you so much for doing this. But I'm, we're not ending just yet. We're not ending just yet. We still have um, we still have to announce our winners. So thank you guys first of all for tuning in. Thank you for entering our contest. And I, I don't have drums. Greg, I'm not going to make you pull up drums, but I'll do my own little drum fill. And the winner of two HPH MT8 headphones are Wendy Green and Bijan Albuye. Forgive me if I pronounce that wrong, but congrats, guys. You both won each a pair of the HPH MT8 headphones from Yamaha. Um, it's the headphones I'm using during the Hangouts, so they're wonderful. There headphones. you go. They're, I mean, Yamaha makes some killer headphones. So, congrats, Wendy, and again, Bijan or Bijan. I don't know if it's pronounced with the je. Um, but thank you guys for entering. I do want to also mention uh, before we go, we still have our financing. So, if you want to get any Steinberg pro or not any, but there are plenty of Steinberg products and Cubase products that are applicable for Sam Ash financing. So if you were to buy it now, you could pay it off in installments. Um, if you have any questions about Steinberg or Cubase products in general, of course, you can always ask Greg on his live stream. We're also happy to answer on um, if you go to samash.com. If you go to uh, if you call 1-800-4, number four, Sam Ash. A representative can help you find the right products for your needs. Uh, if you also go into a Sam Ash store, all our stores are open. We are conducting very safe environments. We are sterilizing after all uses of instruments. So if you pick up a guitar, we'll wipe it down. Pick it, play a keyboard, we'll wipe it down. We are doing social distancing. We're, ma we're only having a certain minimum of people in the store at any given time. Uh, we want you guys to No, We don't want... Uh, anything to deter you from chasing your musical dreams and going on your musical journey. So we want you to be safe, but we also want you to have fun. So we hope to see you in our stores. We hope to hear from you online, whether through socials or through our website. 
Uh, I could rattle on and on and on. But again, thank you guys for tuning in. And if you're re-watching this, thank you for taking the time to re-watch this. Um, Greg, is there anything you'd like to say on behalf of Steinberg and Cubase? No, just we hope that everyone's able to make some great music. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, I've been dealing with Sam Ash for a long time when the farthest out store was Cherry Hill. So, you know, it's wonderful to see how Sam Ash has grown and still such a great family run business. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Well, like I said, Greg's a pro, both as a person and as a Cubase professional. Again, you can catch him on the UV, uh, Cubase YouTube channel. Trying to think if you could call it U base like the stream. Mm -hmm. Forget that. That's a conversation for you and I to have later on. Um, but in any case, again, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, we will be back with Greg on a future date. Just keep following us on all socials to know when and where you can watch the stream. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again and take care.